Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Fiona Levy. I am the Executive Director of the Sala Institute for Child and Family Centered Care here at NYU Langone Medical Center. And on behalf of uh, Nutrition Services and Children's Services and the Squash Program, I'd like to welcome everyone here towards our uh, first conference of what we hope will be many on transforming pediatric nutrition through youth and family partnerships. Um, this work of family engagement in everything we do is really core to our mission here at NYU Langone, and so we're very excited to share with you a lot of the great work that's going on. This um, conference would not be made possible without the really generous support of the SQUASH program here at NYU. And SQUASH stands for, and I always have to look it up, Smart Choices, Quality Ingredients, Unique, Appetizing, Simple, and Healthy. And this program really at its, at its roots is all about making nutrition sound for children and their families and making it interesting and making sure that we really help them get better through good nutritional services, whether we're keeping them well or whether we're helping them recover from disease. This program has provided a host of innovations in pediatric nutritional care, and as I said, is completely in lockstep with our work to ensure that we have very strong patient and family partnerships in everything we do. We were very lucky to receive a generous gift from our donor, Linda Godson Robinson, and her family back in 2012, and that's what led to the creation of the squash program. So we have a very ambitious agenda for this evening. Um, from 5.30 to 6.30, we have um, a talk for you entitled, Just One More Bite, question mark, How Feeding May Influence Kids Eating. And our speakers for that are Jill Castle and Randy Cozart. The, you should have speaker biographies in your packet so that you're not gonna have to sit here and listen to me extol all the wonderful qualities and qualifications of our speakers. We'll then, after that talk, have a few minutes for questions, and then we'll go into our next talk on partnering with families in nutrition care, and that's Dr. Jeremiah Levine and Jackie Ballou Erdos, and then William Diaz, who will also bring the important perspective of the patient and family to the discussion. Again, we'll have the talk followed by five minutes of questions. At the end of these two riveting presentations. We invite you to stay with us for a mix and mingle. We'll have uh, not only the hors d'oeuvres that went out earlier, but um, we'll replenish the bar and have past hors d'oeuvres so that we really encourage you to stay and mingle with our speakers and with each other. And I'm also supposed to remind you to fill out your evaluations, and then during the mix and mingle at 7.30, we'll be, uh, have the raffle drawings for the three great baskets you saw. So without further ado, I will turn this over to Jen, Jill Castle and uh, Randy Kozar and welcome you all. Hey everyone, can you hear me? I'm, I might stand here behind the podium and get in trouble for doubling up on microphone. I'm, my name's Jill and tonight I'm gonna talk about sort of the softer side of nutrition for kids. We talk a lot about food and nutrition and that is super duper important for children to grow well and to develop normally. But there's also another aspect of nutrition for children, and that's feeding. And lo and behold, it's 2016, and we have so much evidence now about how feeding children can influence how well they eat or how poorly they eat. So I'm going to take you through a bunch of slides. I'm going to really go right up to the end of my uh, time with you. And Randy and I are going to toggle back and forth, so she's going to share some real life uh, stories for you as well. I'm gonna start with a picture of the Waltons. How many of you are familiar with that family? Yeah, I grew up watching the Waltons. <laughs> and um, the reason I put this up here is to sort of just personify that uh, feeding children seemed like it was so much easier back then. I'm not sure that food and nutrition was easier, uh, but feeding kids was easier. Everybody came to the family table, everybody sat around, food was passed around, people took what they wanted to eat, they might have been encouraged to eat more or clean their plates, but you get the sense that feeding a family was more unified, more of an event, a daily part of, of the day, and it seemed to be overall easier. I work with a lot of families and feeding isn't all that easy. 
Uh, we have picky eaters. We have children with weight problems, underweight, overweight. We have kids with food allergies. We have children with learning difficulties who don't like to sit at the table. So there's a lot of challenges that families are facing right now. Um, you can see one in three kids are overweight or obese. Eating disorders are on the rise, especially in boys and children under age 12. Food allergies, autism, ADHD, all of these conditions certainly affect how children perceive food and how willing they are to eat it when they come to the table. Picky eating lasts longer. In fact, most of the clients that I work with who have picky eating are over the age of six. So it's not something that kids t tend to grow out of necessarily. And we know that how you feed children greatly influences how long picky eating is going to last. There are more body image concerns. Certainly, you know, there's more nutrient poor food choices to navigate in our world. And certainly, food is more marketed. Uh, the marketing to children is, is more and more and growing. And that makes it difficult for families to navigate food as well. So what does this lead to? Fear and confusion. And not only that, uh, we get stuck on these messages of the right food that we want to be feeding our children. And we just narrow our focus to just getting food right. And we forget about child development and how that influences children's eating. We forget about this how of feeding, which I'm going to explain more to you tonight so you have a better sense of it. But I believe that we're, we're not really eating, we shouldn't be as, as professionals working with children focusing on eating right. We should really be focusing on feeding right because feeding is the food, it is the, the interaction, and it is the child development, all sort of dovetailed together. We can get all those three things right and get a handle on it. We have children that actually enjoy coming to the meal table tend to make the healthy choice, but also know how to navigate the unhealthy choices in the world. Today's parent um, is certainly more short-term focused than uh, might be good for them. And when I say short-term focused, these are clients that are coming to me and saying, what's the best cereal for my child? What's the best yogurt? Which has the lowest sugar? Should my child have any candy? It's very short-term focused. Uh, and they're focused on getting their children to eat healthy today. They're focused on the right food. They're frustrated with their children because their children aren't making the right choices and may not be eating healthfully. And overall, children are eating less well and aren't regulating their eating as well as they can. Versus a long-term view, which is really, what's my food system and what's my feeding strategy? And what's my long-term goal for raising a healthy child? So we're teaching kids to eat healthy for a lifetime. We're teaching them healthy foods, but we're also teaching them how to navigate unhealthy foods. We're focused on what we're feeding them, how we're doing it, and the developmental milestones that could potentially get in our way as our children grow. Parents are knowledgeable, they're patient, and they're prepared for the challenges that are inevitable. I don't know a parent, and I have four children, and it's not clean sailing for me, and I have a ton of information at my fingertips. So I don't know really that it's easy for parents. So we need to help them. Children eat better when you have a long-term perspective, I believe. They're better regulated with their food intake, and they enjoy, enjoy eating more. So Randy is going to tell. We're going to meet Randy. <laughs> Hi, everyone. After a few years of struggling, I'm going to talk about the NICU years. Uh, after a few years of struggling with infertility and with the help of modern medicine, my son was born March of 2001, and he was born at one pound seven ounces at 24 weeks and three days. He was in the hospital at, for 114 days, and he was born right here at NYU, Langone. So my dreams of nursing, of feeding, of bathing, of dressing him, of socializing uh, were immediately stolen from me and had to re be replaced with a, new, with a new normal. Given his birth weight, it wasn't until he was about 13 years old that we were able to talk in terms of percentiles for his height and weight. He just wasn't on the charts. 
But in the NICU, the instinctual act to feed and to care for my son had to be really carefully outweighed between all the medical procedures, the bedside treatments, the chaos that was going on in those days, um, and all the emergency interventions. At six days old, he had his first surgery to repair a diaphragmatic hernia. But at 35 weeks, we reached a major milestone, and we were able to, I was able to, nurse and to feed him, and it was a tremendous celebration for our family. So what was helpful? In the NICU, I was educated on how to take care of a micro premature baby. I was educated on what to do with swaddling and feeding and kangarooing, feeling more prepared as a parent, as a mother, than any other full-time mother that I knew. Um, but in understanding the importance of food and its benefits for a premature baby, I prepared all his own foods from scratch from the moment he was able to feed and transition from uh, milk to puree. And at seven months old, he was able to uh, make that transition. Um, and the reason why he stayed on it for those seven months and as long as that plan was for was his proneness to hernias and muscle tone, very common for premature baby babies. And it was really my pediatrician's suggestion just to take a real slow and steady approach. Um, and also being educated from our pediatrician that each child is different, each story is different, and care planning is very different for every single child. What could have been done differently in the NICU? Um, I didn't know, I wasn't educated on the role of a registered dietitian. I didn't know where that service fit into to our care plan. Um, it would have been very beneficial leaving the hospital and being able to check in and call the registered dietitian with you know, feeding tips and weight gaining. So that would have been extremely beneficial um, you know, for us during those years. Um, and I'll talk about my middle years after the next uh, segue. Okay. So <clears throat> there, there they're going home now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So micro preemies have really very different and unique nutritional needs, and they also are high risk for feeding difficulties. For any of you who work with them, you know that. Um, many uh, picky eaters, sensory uh, integration uh, issues, um, there's a lot of um, potential problems that affect eating and growth in the micro preemie and even just in the regular premature infant. So that's a red flag that anybody who's working with young children, if that's a his part of their history, you're going to be digging deeper into understanding how that impacted that child's ability to eat, transition to solid foods, and to grow. But let's talk about feeding styles and practices. I'm showcasing this a little bit different. I'm going to talk about the four different feeding styles as we know it in the research. But then I'm going to quickly tag on the associated practices that we see. So it, the practices are really how these feeding styles show up, show up in day-to-day -day life. So there are four feeding styles authoritarian, which is also known as controlling. That's sort of the new modern name for it in the literature. Permissive, also known as indulgent. Neglectful, which is uninvolved, and I'll describe all of these in detail in a second. And then authoritative, which is sort of the love with limits, uh, monitoring feeding style. There are four that are identified in the literature. Typically, our feeding style is uh, inherited from our childhood. So if you were raised by authoritarian parents, your go-to feeding style is most likely authoritarian as well. Unless it was such a bad experience for you, and I've had clients this way, it was such a bad experience for you that you flipped to the other side and you became permissive. So the strong controlling uh, parenting style get, or feeding style gets swapped over to a very lax permissive feeding style. All four there, we tend to dip into all of them on different occasions, but one is our predominant style. When we're talking about feeding styles, it's not like we're talking about it in a vacuum or in a box. There's a lot of things that influence how we interact and, and how our feeding style is demonstrated throughout um, raising children. Stress depression. We know if you're working with clients or with parents who have a lot of stress in their lives, who might be depressed, 
they tend to be more uninvolved or to be more neglectful in their feeding style. This is what the literature shows. Um, for, for socioeconomic um, levels that are lower socioeconomic levels, particularly in Hispanic moms, we know again from the, from the literature, they tend to use restrictive feeding practices or be per, uh, use pressuring. So push their children to eat more food. Again, all of this comes out in the day-to-day -day interaction around the table. And over the long term, we can see changes in children's weight and uh, their willingness to eat and the types of foods that they actually like to eat. <clears throat> we also know that a mother's weight status influences how she feeds her child. If she's overweight, she may tend to be more restrictive in her feeding style with her children if she has fears that she will be that her child will be overweight as well. Again, all of this demonstrated in the literature. A child's weight can also change how a mother feeds her child. If the child is overweight, a mother may be more restrictive in her feeding of her child versus a child who is underweight, the mother may be more pushing or pressuring that child to eat more food. And you're going to see what happens when we do this, uh, when, when we see this happening with children. The other aspect of this is the parent-child relationship, which is uber important. It's the one thing we should all be trying to cultivate for our own families, but when we're working with clients as well. A positive parent-child relationship. Everything hinges, every success hinges on a successful positive parent-child relationship. And that is, the foundation of that is trust. So, there's a, uh, I call it trust-based feeding. There's the trust model of feeding. It's the same thing. But essentially, it, um, it is demonstrated that you know, the parent is, trusts the child to be able to self-regulate their eating. How many of you know parents or are a parent uh, who, or who have worked with parents where you see full trust from the parent in the child's ability to self-regulate their eating? It's not frequent that I see it. I see it sometimes, but it's oftentimes something we have to work on and address because many parents today, and again, going back to those early slides, the, the food environment that we live in and the barrage of food at every corner, parents don't have that trust and that faith that their child can self-regulate their appetite and their eating. But the trust-based model is that the parent believes the child can self-regulate the parent believes the child can recognize his own hunger and fullness. And on the other side, the child trusts the parent to provide predictable, nourishing meals in a pleasant environment. So it's a two-way process. If there is low trust, what we tend to see is a more controlling feeding style. If there is high trust, we tend to see a more authoritative or that love with limits style. However, if it's too trusting, and Trust is probably not the right word, but oftentimes I will see parents who um, completely rely on their children to make the food decisions, to decide when it's time to eat. Like they put all the control in the child's lap to make decisions, and that doesn't work as either. Um, with picky eaters, we tend to see pushing and catering. We'll talk about this a little bit more. The big eater or the overweight child, we tend to, to see restricting and controlling feeding. And in the underweight child or the picky eater who is not eating well, we'll see pushing and more nagging to eat. It's human nature. Uh, we worry about our children, especially children who are picky or who are underweight. We worry. We want them to eat more. So it's sort of a human nature thing. But it does have an impact on how well they do with eating. Randy. The middle years. Following our son's discharge from the NICU, uh, each exam, each follow-up exam with our pediatrician always included a conversation about his cognitive development, his diet, his diet um, and any medical issues that were, were presenting themselves during these years. Um, very common during these years that, you know, the, all these issues present themselves for, for premature babies. Um, but given what I was prepared for from a pediatrician, it was 
a blessing for us to have a child with extremely high coping skills and the ability to really clearly articulate when he wasn't feeling well and he knew himself extremely well what when things were going right with himself and when things were not when he wasn't at his best between the ages of one and ten he was admitted to the hospital a total of six times and out of those six times uh, three were for abdominal complications uh, he had two hernia surgeries and he had a bowel obstruction when he was nine years old. But from a very early age, Jared always had an amazing appreciation for food and a very varied diet. We exposed him from a very early age to every cuisine possible. Um, his favorite food when he was eight years old was anchovy pizza. And um, he was able to really understand and appreciate good food to the point where he was reading the content labels and he knew empty calories from, from, uh, from bad calories and um, he just really knew his body and how it was responding. Um, to that point, he knew when he was able to, when, he, when his belly was full. When he was full, he just felt tired and uh, that was his self-regulating and he just always was able to leave the table and push away. To give you a frame of his height and weight at this time, because we were starting to track a little bit. Um, at nine years old, he weighed 52 and a quarter pounds, and his height was uh, 52 inches. At 10 years old, he uh, weighed 57 and a half pounds, and he was 53 inches. So what was helpful during these years, when we were admitted to the hospital for the bowel obstruction, I really became very um, aware of the role of a re registered dietitian who visited us very frequently while we were in the hospital and provided a lot of education to Jared and, and our family. Um, but what could have been done differently in looking back on it is giving his real appreciation for food and how he was really engaged in his own care plan um, for the possible registered dietitian to really work with him one-on-one -on -one and to really be creative and fun and create really uh, food plans that would really resonate with him. Handouts for teenagers, uh, well at this age, were not, um, it didn't serve a purpose for, for <coughs> him, so um, he, he, we didn't find that uh, particularly useful. Um, but just really understanding the role of the registered dietitian at this age really, really forged our way for, for going forward. So this was very helpful. Okay. So um, I love what Randy said about exposure because the more research that comes out, that is the key to a varied diet in children. Uh, is the more you can expose in that first five years, that's the goal, the first five years is to get as many different varieties of foods um, to get children to taste a wide variety, all kinds of flavors, all kinds of spices, hot, sweet, bitter, everything under the sun. Um, <clears throat> and we're learning so much more about the maternal diet too in terms of the variety of foods that moms eat when they're pregnant. That sets the palate on some level. Um, and then remember too that children are always gonna go for sweets and, and fatty foods because amniotic fluid is sweet, breast milk is sweet. They're already genetically programmed to like sweets. So I oftentimes I'm calming parents down because you know it's genetically sort of there. Sweet, a preference for sweets is already there. So the more they get exposed, the bigger that preference becomes. Okay, so back to feeding styles. So the authoritarian feeding style is characterized by a low sensitivity of the parent to a child's hunger and fullness and to his food preferences. So it's sort of a clean your plate, you're going to do it my way, this is what's for dinner, eat it all, then you can leave. So I was raised that way. I think a lot of people in my generation were raised with that um, sort of approach. Um, it's a demanding feeding style, so there's a lot of rules and uh, a lot of expectations, which aren't a bad thing. I think rules and expectations on some level are good for all children. Uh, but if they're oppressive, and uh, you'll see how this plays out, they can, they can um, be counterproductive to children eating well and being at a healthy body weight. So it's the do as I say, not as I do, clean your plate, high structure, clear rules, 
what we see in the literature and all of the research in feeding styles is associative in nature. It's a very difficult area to research, but we have an abundance of research now, and it's all pretty much saying the same thing. So uh, this is associative in nature, uh, but what we see is that children who are raised with an authoritarian feeding style, they're poor food regulators. They don't have a good sense of their hunger, and they don't have a good sense of their fullness. Um, and mostly, you can see um, there is a correlation with overweight and obesity in children who are raised this way. Again, if you're not hungry and you have to sit at the table and clean your plate, you're potentially eating beyond your appetite. You're potentially overeating. So that's how that feeding style can play out. We also see that kids who are raised with this authoritarian feeding style are less inclined to like fruits and vegetables. So it's they, they tend to not go for those types of foods. Why? Because those foods are usually the foods that they have to finish at the table before they're allowed to, to leave. So when we look at sort of the feeding practices, so how does authoritarian feeding, that style, how does it show up in the day-to-day -day workings of a family? Uh, we know that controlling feeding during infancy can be a positive thing. We have research that shows that children up to age two, when they're raised with a fairly controlling envir a controlled environment in terms of a structure with eating and their food choice, they show a healthy BMI by the age of two. But something gets off track after age two. And this is where developmental milestones come in, because toddlers are little independent creatures who want to do what they want to do. And so the feeding dynamics and the feeding styles and what's happening at that high chair can get really off track. Children over age two, when they're fed in a controlling way, tend to not regulate their eating well. They tend to eat in the absence of hunger, experience overeating and potential weight gain. Again, all in the literature. Long term, there's a, there are negative effects on the quality of a child's diet. Uh, because they have lower preference for healthier foods. And you'll see why in a second here. So there are practices that are associated with authoritarian feeding are restricting, rewarding, and my brain's blank, but we'll see it's on the slide. So restricting basically means you're restricting types of food or second portions or amounts of food. So how does that play out? No, you can't have a second slice of bread at the table. No, you can't have um, any sugar, any sugar whatsoever. And believe me, <laughs> there are parents who do this. Um, that's called restricting. And what the literature, literature tells us is that um, kids are driven for the food that is restrictive. So if you restrict bread or carbs at home, children tend to want those foods. It's kind of human psychology. What you can't have, that's what you want, right? They, we also see that children who are restri experience restriction eat in the absence of hunger. Eating in the absence of hunger is a research terminology. It basically means they're eating for boredom, emotional reasons, or other reasons outside of hunger. They have poor self-regulation are at increased risk for overweight or obesity, and as I said, they value the restricted food. I have a story, one of my best friends in college. She was not allowed to have any sugar growing up. No cookies, no candy, nothing. She talks, she's 50, she talks about it freely now. She's obsessed with sweets, and it goes back to her childhood. So we're always thinking about how, you know, how are we programming our children to relate to food? How we feed them can certainly influence how we're uh, setting up their future relationship with food. Prompting and pressuring to eat is the one I couldn't remember, but this is also a controlling or authoritarian feeding style practice. It's a sign of the practice, or it's a sign of the style, sorry. So prompting and pressuring, that's the mom who has a picky eater who's chasing their toddler with the sippy cup. Have another drink, have another drink. Don't you want to eat that last bite? Aren't you hungry? You haven't had anything to eat for a couple of hours. That's prompting and pressuring, that constant nagging, that reminding, that um, 
need or that urge to make sure your child eats. And that comes out in this prompting and pressuring. What we see in the literature, children have a lower ability to regulate their intake. They eat fewer fruits and vegetables. They have increased satiety responsiveness. That means they get full faster. This is hugely important for picky eaters or children who are low body weight. If they experience a lot of pressure and prompting about food, it shuts off their appetite. So it's counterproductive to do that for these children. Slow and fussy eating is very common. And even in the child, again, now we look at personality. If you've got a pleasing child, a child who will do whatever you ask them, ask them to do, and you're asking them to keep eating and keep eating and take another bite, we run the risk of overeating and obesity with this, feeding, with this practice as well. Rewarding, also a practice associated with authoritarian feeding style. 55% of parents of three-year-olds try to get them to eat something healthy with a food reward. And that food reward is almost always a sweet or a dessert. That's a lot. What does rewarding do? It disregards the internal hunger satiety regulation system. It overrides it. And that reward food, parents think they're doing a good job. So we take the broccoli and the ice cream story. Eat the broccoli, you can have the ice cream. Parents think they're helping their children like broccoli. But when we look at the research, what they're actually doing is they're helping their child value the ice cream even more. So they're shifting the food value system for the child. We can get kids to eat today with rewards, but we cannot get kids to like the food we're getting them to eat for the long term. And the research is pretty clear on that. There is a role for non-food rewards, like stickers or more time reading or a movie. That can be helpful to get children to taste a food. And we know exposure is key, and that does not mean sitting in front of asparagus and looking at it. That's not exposure. Exposure is putting it in your mouth and tasting it. And that can take up to 15 times for your normal average child. For a child with behavioral issues or picky eating or sensory, it can take 50, 100 times. And sometimes those kids will never like those foods. So <clears throat> we want to get children to taste food. That's how we get them to like food, but we can't do it effectively using food rewards. So the emerging research on controlling feeding, just to give you sort of a status update. Um, when parents use controlling feeding, we can start to predict what the eating behavior is going to be as early as 12 months of age. We can start to see signs of overeating. We can start to see signs of food value system shifting as early as 12 months. Uh, and we also have evidence that tells us that parents who are controlling with their feeding have no clue. They have no idea. So there's a lot of education that, as healthcare providers, we can do to help parents. Um, when we look at restrictive feeding, and I love twin sample studies because it really can show how a parent's feeding style and feeding practices can shift even within families. So you don't always use the same feeding style or the feeding practices with every child. So what we see is um, when a parent has a heavier child, a heavier twin, the parent tends to be restrictive with that, with that twin. And if the other twin is underweight or low body weight, they tend to pressure that twin. So we actually change our feeding style based on the child, based on the child's weight, the situation. So again, important information to be aware of. Permissive feeding style. This is that lax feeding style. Uh, highly responsive to a child's appetite. Oh, you're hungry? Let's go get something to eat. Oh, you said you're hungry? Let's go get another something to eat. It's that constant feeding every hour on the hour. Uh, low demands of the child and low monitoring. So the parent tends not to be very aware of what the child is eating throughout the day, how much and what types of food. CS parent, the child takes the lead on food decisions, not the, so the parent isn't really driving the boat, the, the child is. Um, and there's little structure. When I say structure, I mean 
breakfast, lunch, dinner occurs at regular times, snacks occur at regular times, it's predictable, it's in the same place. Um, there's very little structure with permissive parent, with permissive feeding. So what we see is increased intake of high fat foods and sweets in children who are raised with this feeding style. We see evidence of high BMI in preschoolers and it is predictive of overweight in Mexican American children. So what are the feeding practices that are associated with permissive feeding style? Catering. How many of you know what catering is? That's the plan B meal. That's the backup plan when what you made didn't work. <laughs> it allows the child to take the lead on food choice. Um, but what we see in the literature is the children who are catered to actually have poor nutrient intake. They're not getting the nutrients that they need because what happens to the diet when you're always making plan B? Plan B isn't very varied, it's usually the same stuff and the diet gets narrower and narrower and narrower in terms of the nutritional quality of it. Food variety is limited and these children are less likely to try new foods. So that's why if you're working with a picky eater, the more you cater to them, it, you're shooting yourself in the foot. You're never going to get them to branch out. You're not going to really get them to expand their food repertoire. And uh, their nutritional intake is going to very potentially suffer. Again, um, when we see with a permissive feeding style, we see parents using food to soothe their, their upset infant. No big surprise, we're seeing earlier infant weight gain. We don't have a lot of guidelines for children under two in terms of obesity prevention. In fact, we don't have any guidelines. We don't have EGAs for children under two. We don't have any guidelines. But what we are seeing in the literature is a clear delineation between permissive feeding and infants under age two uh, associated weight gain. Low nutrient density intake, children under five tend to not uh, eat whole grains when they're raised with a permissive feeding style. That's new information. And the whole intention behind being uh, what, what you're doing with feeding. Are you intending to raise a uh, healthy eater or are you preventing unhealthy eating? What we're seeing in the literature is it's much better to be uh, raising a healthy eater than to be preventing unhealthy eating. Neglectful feeding style, characterized by low responsiveness, low demands of the child, and low structure. There's a lack of rhythm with food and eating. Meals are unreliable. The, the food may not be stocked regularly in the kitchen. Um, I think we're going to see a lot more research coming out, particularly as food insecurity in our country grows, um, because it aligns very well with neglectful feeding style. Uh, children who are raised with a neglectful feeding style tend to be food focused. They're the children who are always like, when's dinner, when's dinner, when's dinner, what's next, what, what are we eating? The children who are really, really hyper focused on when is food happening and what's it going to be. They're twice as likely to have weight problems, both underweight and overweight, if they're raised with a neglectful feeding style, tend to be emotionally insecure around food and may mistrust their parent, depending on what the scenario is. And they also have a low intake of nutrient-rich foods. Again, uh, if we look at depression in low-income families, we start to see a um, feeding style alignment with neglectful feeding. We know that moms who are at risk for depression, anxiety, and stress are at high risk for a neglectful feeding style. We also know that now larger organizations are really pulling feeding styles into their overall global recommendations. So UNICEF um, really focuses on feeding as part of the emotional climate for a child. So we're seeing recommendations come out related to that. I'm not going to spend time on this slide. If you want this slide, just let me know. But basically, I've listed the negative feeding practices, the characteristics of it, and the outcome based on the research. So you can see a lot of stuff going on with feeding. Have, have I said anything about food? No. <laughs> so there's a lot of stuff going on. Negative practices don't work. Uh, there's a lot of evidence to that. 85% of parents try to get their children to eat more at mealtime using praise, rewards, and prompting. 50 to 60% of parents ask their middle school and high school students 
to eat more, right? To clean their plates. Middle school and high school. That's like there's no trust there that your child can self-regulate. You're asking them to continue to clean their plate. 40% asked them to eat more even when they said they were full. That's just not right. We're not raising kids to self-regulate. We're, we're trying to control it all and regulate for them, and that doesn't ever really work very well. Project EAT, eating in teens and young adults. Young adults who use hunger and fullness to guide their eating, so more of an intuitive eating or a mindful eating practice, have healthier weights and are less likely to have disordered eating. Teenage years. So after a few quiet years since the middle years, uh, in May of 2015, we received the news that we weren't expected to hear as a family, certainly not for our son, Jared. Um, our son was diagnosed with Crohn's disease. This completely came out of left field. We were not prepared for this at all. My only uh, education about Crohn's is that my brother has had it for the last 30 years as an adult, and two family friends have it as adults, and a teenage friend of Jared's was diagnosed about a year previously. Um, but prior to his diagnosis in May, there were isolated episodes, nothing that came on my radar, that there was something, something wrong, except for one time when he um, was complaining that he was just chronically thirsty. Um, so when I just saw everything and put, pulled everything together, um, we rushed him to the pediatrician, and in, in that moment, he was diagnosed as being severely dehydrated. And um, then immediately rushed to the hospital. Um, and after about a week's stay and a battery of tests that followed, we received the, the, conf the confirmation that he has moderate to severe Crohn's disease. Um, so it's been a year that we received the diagnosis, and um, we embrace it. We embrace our new diagnosis. We embrace our new lifestyle. We, um, it doesn't define my son, and we don't want to treat him any differently. It does make it more complicated, given that he's a foodie. So it really is a, is, is a hard balance that we have to um, kind of manage and help manage with him. Um, but we're still figuring it out. It's a journey. And, um, you know, it goes in, it's a roller coaster and it goes in highs and lows, but we manage it and, and we don't let it define us, as I said. Um, just to give you a little frame of what his height and weight is, in his 14th year exam, he was 78 pounds, uh, 62 inches, and as of yesterday, I just weighed him, he's 96 pounds, so he's not, he's, he's definitely made tremendous progress, and he's, he's shooting for 100 pounds in the next couple of weeks. Um, so that's a big goal for him. Um, what was helpful is that we process this as kind of a village philosophy. We speak to everyone and anyone who has Crohn's, um, adolescents, adults. It helps normalize it for him, um, and it, it just makes him feel that everyone has it. It's just a feeding, it's just a lifestyle change for him. Um, for me, though, it's educating myself on medication and management, um, alternative care plans and conventional treatment plans. Um, in January of this past year, he started, uh, in addition to his drug program that he's on, he started um, through my research on probiotics. And I'm convinced in my mind that he's been in, re he's been in remission f with Crohn's for the last two months, but I'm just convinced that it's really had a tremendous impact, the, the probiotics, in conjunction with his um, drug plan. Uh, what can be done differently is just as providers providing the parent with the full spectrum of, of options, not just the conventional medicines, but just really bringing to the parent the what else is out there. Because without that, we're just left to do our own research and calling and, and spending a lot of time on the internet when conversations on the table would be tremendously helpful by our providers. Um, so just in summary, just to highlight that parenting, parenting and its relationship with food, regardless if the baby is full-term or preemie, is complicated. There's no doubt. Um, but 
with the preemie, there is definitely a given that there's cognitive and developmental challenges and many victories that you'll be facing uh, along the way. Um, but as a parent, the only advice I can give everyone in the room is if you're a provider for a baby, a child, or a teenager, just get to know them, you know, get to know what their interests are, get to know what they enjoy, get to know their culture, get to know everything about them. Um, but most importantly, just tailor a plan, a care plan specifically for them. And that makes them feel just really important that you really took the time. Um, and that's just going to engage them and the family, and it's going to make this experience just tremendously positive. So thank you. <laughs> okay, so um, thank you, Randy. So you heard um, about all the negative, all the yucky negative stuff, the negative feeding styles, the negative feeding practices. So let's um, end this last part with feeding that works. So what is the feeding style that actually is effective and how can that play out in the day to day? And I'm gonna zoom through it um, because I know a lot of you already know this stuff, I'll highlight it, uh, but you'll start to get a sense of, of what it looks like to positively feed children. So the authoritative feeding style is the big winner, has two T's in the word, that's plus plus, that's how people can remember it most effectively. Um, it's highly responsive to a child's appetite and food preferences, but there's also high demands. I like to call it the love with limits. It's empathetic, it's encouraging, but it is also boundary oriented. Uh, structured feeding, so again, I mentioned that earlier. Meals and snacks occur at relatively the same time every day, give or take a few minutes, but relatively the same time. Um, boundaries, the kitchen is closed between meals and snacks. We're not in the kitchen constantly eating, foraging through the pantry. We shut it down as parents and kids go off and do other things that are non-food oriented. We allow children to have reasonable choice. Reasonable choice is you, you can have an apple or a banana, or you can have a glass of milk or some yogurt, or, and I'll go through some examples of this, but we do give children a say in the matter, but we don't give them control of food and feeding. We are responsive to hunger, fullness, and our children's food preferences. And what happens when we use authoritative feeding style? Children eat more fruits and vegetables and dairy products. They're more active, they're leaner, their body weights are more in the healthy range. And we help protect them against emotional eating. So authoritative works. Again, the body of research is pretty clear. You're gonna probably start seeing authoritative feeding styles incorporated into preschool nutrition, uh, school age nutrition, daycare nutrition, it's, it's regarded as uh, the positive way to feed children. It's warm, it's involved, it's sensitive to children, but it also encourages maturity and self-control and self-regulation. Again, leaner active kids who eat healthier. Doesn't everybody want that? I think that's what everybody wants. Uh, it's anchored in trust-based feeding and it's anchored also in maternal monitoring. So we see then what that, you know, it's not controlling, it's monitoring. So we have to be aware of how our children are eating, what they're eating and how well they're eating, but we're not controlling that, but we have a good sense of it. Okay, so this all hinges on responsive feeding. This goes way back to infancy. If you ever um, raised an infant, breastfed an infant, it's like the hallmark, the gold standard for what responsive feeding is. Baby cries, you feed it. When it's done eating, it pulls off, and off we go, right? So that's being, that, being aware and sensitive to those cues, responding to them appropriately, that's what responsive feeding is all about. It promotes self-regulation. Again, the literature is very clear on this. And um, we see that when children, uh, when parents use responsive feeding, we are seeing fewer problems with weight issues in children. So it's something we want to incor incorporate in our teachings. The best time to do it is in the first two years of life, is in infancy. The division of responsibility. Again, this is a way to think about 
uh, the child and the parent and their relative jobs around food and eating. This was coined by Ellen Satter, who is also a registered dietitian and a licensed social worker. The child has jobs, the parent has jobs. The parent's jobs are to determine what's being offered in terms of food, where it's being offered, and what time it's being offered. And the child's jobs is to decide if they're going to eat what the parent offers and how much. It's pretty simple. But when we start to come over on the child's job as a parent or the parent or the child comes over into the parent's job, everything gets off whack. Everything gets off track. So the, the essential structure, boundaries, and reasonable choice, I, I mentioned that earlier. Uh, when we talk about boundaries, a lot of times I find I'm, I'm working really hard with parents about setting boundaries around food. It's hard. It's not easy today in, in our world. Uh, ratio of healthy to unhealthy foods. Parent is in charge of the food purchases. Parent is in charge of the food decisions in the home when they go out. Um, and, and the parent is in charge of the kitchen. Reasonable choice. The child has a voice. They're allowed to say no to eating. And they're also allowed to choose between two or three, three food options. Structure. It varies based on the age of the child. Uh, regular timing of meals and snacks. Uh, you know, for an infant and toddler, they're having three meals, three snacks. Again, think about their bellies. They're tiny. They got 40 nutrients to get in a day. And so they have to eat frequently. So it's about every two to three hours. For the preschooler, every three to four hours. For the school age, the teen as well. Teenagers are more like adults. They can stretch out to five hours. But you're setting a structure for feeding. Um, it should say, I'm sorry, 20 to 30 minutes for meals and five to 15 minutes for snacks. In terms of the duration, I had a client yesterday. My son sits at the table for an hour. That's counterproductive. There's nothing good happening for a child who's sitting at the meal table for an hour. There's nothing good happening. So we need to start doing this basic education with families to help them get the feeding component in a positive place. And again, location, family table, kitchen, somewhere that's predictable and usual. You occasionally sit in front of the TV, you occasionally have a meal in the car, that's not a big deal. But when your child is saying, where do we eat? When the pediatrician says, where are you eating your meals? You want your child to say, at the kitchen table, right? <clears throat> Boundaries, limits help shape children's behavior and that goes for eating as well. Boundaries put the parent in charge, helps regulate excess eating, and it, it, it starts the education of courtesy and manners. I, I teach my clients ask first, meaning children have to ask first. They come through the parent before they go and help themselves. Again, ideally you're starting these when, when children are really, really young. It's a little hard to implement them when you've got a teenager on your hand. So we want to get catch families early. Uh, the kitchen is closed. I described that before. You close the meal. After meals, you close the kitchen. It's closed. I actually have a story. This weekend I had house guests, and um, we got up on Saturday morning, and we had bagels. They brought New York bagels to Connecticut, so of course we were all feeding frenzy on the New York bagels. And then an hour later, my husband starts making eggs and bacon. I'm like, okay, that's cool. You know, we're just, we had breakfast, now we're having eggs and bacon. Okay. So I go to clean everything up, and then my guest starts going into the refrigerator for carrots and hummus and strawberries and I mean it, the kitchen never closed all day it never closed and by the end of the day it really and I understand why we were there on a vacation whatever so it's all totally different and their child was really but their excuse was their child's really thin and their child is hungry all the time and I thought this is constant feeding this is no good either. It doesn't matter if your child's at a healthy body weight. It doesn't matter if your child's eating carrots and berries all day long. It's not a good, you're not cultivating good eating habits when, when that happens. Reasonable choice. Here's some examples. This helps parents stay in charge of food. Would you like green beans or broccoli? You can have candy now at the pool or you can have ice cream after dinner for, for, uh, for dessert. It's your choice. So you're giving children a say. Dinner with us, this is what I say to my teens. Dinner with us, or should I save a plate for later? What's the implication? You're eating my food. You're not running out to the local diner. You're eating my food. Do you want it now? Or should I save you a plate? 
navigating meals. So parents are always um, interested in how do I actually make this happen? Well, I, especially with children who might not be great at eating whatever you're serving. I always say serve one or two items that are considered safe by the child. Safe means they're familiar, they're identifiable, and they're liked. What does that mean for children? Oftentimes it's a dairy product, it's bread, or it's fruit. When you have those items on the table, children can come to the table, feel comfortable, sit down, know there's something on the table for them to eat. When you have a child who's more hesitant about food and you put on this gourmet meal that's all mixed up, it may be that you get uh, a child who is upset, won't eat, and the, and the drama at the table begins. So it's, it's incorporating safe foods at the table really can help children quite a bit. Family meals, we love to see kids and families getting together three to five times a week for a family meal. Um, meal is sort of a loose terminology. It can be a snack. It doesn't have to be both parents. One parent suffices according to the literature. Um, and then how you serve food. Do you plate everything on a plate and give it to your child and say, eat this? Or do you do it Walton style, where everything's on the table and everybody can pick what foods that you're serving and the amounts that are right for their body? So we see that family style, I almost always try to convert my clients over to family style. It's much more pleasant for families. That is always a win. The drama, the stress, the standoffs at the table almost immediately disappear. Um, but then we work on proper um, portions, portion awareness. I'm not a portion control person. I'm a portion awareness person. We build that knowledge in, into the family and into the children. And we let children self-regulate. We let them make mistakes at the table. We let them take too much food and not eat it. We let them undereat and see what it feels like. So they are learning. Obviously, we want parents to role model. It's really hard to set a high standard for children if you're not doing it for yourself. So walk the talk, exercise, eat healthy, regulate your eating and your weight, meaning don't be a mindless eater, diet, lose weight, gain weight, all this you know, stuff. Be reasonable with your sleep. Respect your body and say nice things about your body. Your children hear these things, and that's how they're going to view their own bodies and other people as well. And then have the right attitude. All, fit, all foods can fit. There are foods that are, that, you know, are not, there's no food that's really, unless it's a really poisonous food, which somebody could tell me something, but no food is going to derail your health. So everything can fit in. It's not about what you're eating, it's the balance that you're striking and how it all works over the course of time. So we want to target the whole child. When we focus only on food, it underserves our families. It really fails to get to the root of many of the nutrition and feeding issues in the child. If we singularly address how we're feeding and we forget about the nutrition stuff, that's not enough either because it neglects our present day food environment which parents today need to know how to manage. And what I like is this modern approach which where we're looking at what, how, and why. We get the feeding approach right and we get the food right. We anticipate and manage developmental changes. So we're prepared for what's coming down the pike. And we elevate the parent. We educate them so they understand, they know what to do. Because it stinks to be a parent and feel like you're making all the mistakes and not doing things right. And partly why parents make mistakes is because we do a terrible job in this country of educating new parents and current parents on how to feed their children. So eight takeaway thoughts for you to sort of ponder tonight. You can talk to me at the cocktail hour or what, the, the, the party afterwards if you have questions about this, but this is sort of a mantra for how I feel about children and nutrition. Eating healthy food does not guarantee a healthy child. So we need to sort of lose that. It's much more, it's bigger than food. Perfect nutrition doesn't exist. So don't feed that myth, because that myth really makes parents feel really guilty and feel like failures. Nutrition is personal. There's a lot of history behind parenting and feeding children, and you need to get personal with your clients and understand where they're coming from. Food and nutrition is only a slice of the childhood nutrition pie. There's more to it. 
trust, connection, and responsiveness need more time at the table, if anything, bring this to your clients. I get questions from professionals all the time. My pa I can't reach my clients. They don't want to talk about food anymore. I'm like, yeah, because it's out there all over the place. Give them something else. Give them something about feeding styles to think about. Give them something about feeding practices. Give them a way to connect with their children better and more uh, responsively. Give that to them. Give them something new. Parents shape eating attitudes and behaviors, but you also um, need to understand what their eating habits, their attitudes, and their behaviors are. When I have a client that sits across from me and says sugar is poison, I know what her eating and food attitudes are. are I know what that child's got to live with and what, what, where she's coming from. And so I'm not only helping that child, I'm going to be helping her sort of change her thinking because that thinking is not going to help her child. Children shape a, parent, a parent's feeding approach to some extent, so we need to lose this idea that parents are to blame. Parents are not to blame. They're, I work with a lot of parents. They're doing the best they can with the information that they have. We need to give them more information so that they are better at their job. And negative feeding styles and practices are barriers to raising healthy eaters and may contribute to eating and weight pathology. So there you have it. Am I finished on time? Thank you. <laughs>